Brother Masons, lovely ladies, honored guests, welcome to the Minneapolis Valley of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite. Tonight you will be viewing the second in a series of visits from the Celestial Lodge by famous Masons, those men who not only changed America, but changed the world. Will the Masons in attendance please rise and join me in giving grand honors to worshipful brother George Washington of Virginia. Taking your time from me, three times three. Is this, is this the same sword presented on the battleground by my beloved son, Gilbert de Maudier, the Marquis de Lafayette? Please allow a moment of repose, lest I embarrass myself with tears of gratitude. My brothers, holding again this sword brings forth remembrances of my life that shall no doubt aid in my discourse. It gives me great joy that it is being kept safe in the hands of such noble brothers. I had asked for nothing more than a small carafe of Madeira wine, having long wished to savor again its exquisite taste while I am briefly in this corporeal form. Brother Masons, fair ladies, honored guests, allow me to introduce myself. I am your most humble and obedient servant, Brother George Washington of Virginia. I thank you profusely for your kind invitation that allows me to meet tonight with my brothers. Illustrious Brother Albert Pike delivered assurance that I am in company with a gathering of dedicated Master Masons who will joyfully share in my confidences. I would be remiss in not bringing you Brother Pike's warmest greetings and to express to you the pleasure he found while in your company. In the short time granted me by heaven, I wish to speak to you not as general or president, but to have you know me as man and mason, and to share in the path the destiny laid before me, to tell you about those events and people that helped shape me into who I was to become, to talk to you about the impact that masonry had upon my life, nay, to tell you about Freemasonry's impact on the very foundation of our nation and of the extraordinary group of men, our brothers, with whom I shared so much, from whom I learned so much, and for whom I cared so much. Because of the short time allowed my presence by the Supreme Architect, I must perchance leave out much more of my life than I may include. Hopefully, what I have to share will give you facts and circumstances as not generally known. If the supreme architect of the universe would have given me choice to pick any time or place in history to have lived, I would choose none other than that granted me, a time when a small number of exemplary men of great intelligence, courage, and foresight banded together to create a new world and change the course of history in such a profound manner. I am eternally humbled to have been allowed to stand beside them as they created a way of life of the people, for the people, and by the people. 
for you to understand fully that place and time, let me take you back to the Virginia colony of my youth to speak about the formative years of my life, to affirm, explain, or deny the legends that may have come to your attention. My father, Augustine, was the fourth generation of Washington men to live in the colonies. The men of the family, hard-working stewards of the land, were driven by a deep desire to possess land and bring forth its bounty. In the Virginia colony, they found their destiny. My father, in the family tradition, tilled the soil while also acquiring the skills of a surveyor. My father had, through inheritance, acquired a small plantation of about 1,100 acres. Upon establishing himself, he took to wife a charming young orphan named Jane Butler. Using her substantial dowry, they were able to increase their holdings to almost 2,800 acres. Jane Washington was a lady of great learning and culture. During their happy marriage, they produced four children. My brothers, Lawrence and Augustine Jr., known commonly as Austin, as well as a son, Butler, and a daughter who did not survive to adulthood. Austin and Lawrence would have a substantial influence on my youth. Unfortunately, Jane died before her 30th birthday, leaving my father with the task of raising children and several plantations to manage. So, not long after Jane's death, he took to wife one Mary Ball, my mother. Lacking the culture, grace, and social skills of my father's first wife, my mother was self-serving and of a cold nature and demanding. I believe it was mainly a marriage of convenience. However, even with my father's frequent absences, they did find enough commonality to produce six children, I being the oldest. I wish to show no disrespect. But to explain the various influences of my youth, I must speak of the good and the bad. Although denied the love, affection, and nurturing, which is every child's due from their mother. All my lifetime, I treated her with the respect and the deference owed by a son to his mother and saw after her needs all her life. I realized that my desire for that denied love, respect, and self-worth I so missed influenced many of my decisions throughout my life. In my 11th year, while living at our fairy farm plantation, my father suddenly passed away. I had hoped to follow my older brothers to England to gain a proper education, but that hope was dashed by my father's death. In my father's will, I was awarded the fairy farm plantation. My brother Austin, the Wakefield plantation, and Lawrence, Huntington Creek, which later became Mount Vernon. Being not of age, the governance of my inheritance was under the control of my mother until my 21st birthday. Although close with both my older brothers, I had a special bond with Lawrence. He became my hero and my protector. In fact, when Lawrence an officer of the Virginia militia, returned from a military engagement at the Battle of Cartagena, wearing his splendid dress uniform. My feelings turned to hero worship, and I wished only to follow in his footsteps. Several months after our father's death, Lawrence married Anne Fairfax, whose family was at the pinnacle of Virginia society. Anne's father, Colonel Fairfax, was the manager of an enormous tract of land of over four million acres, 
granted by the crown to his cousin, Lord Thomas Fairfax, the fifth Lord of Fairfax of Cameron. Lawrence and Anne opened not only their home to me, but also their hearts. This allowed me to escape the dreary existence at Fairy Farm, as I spent as much of my time as possible at their home. To Lawrence, I became the only son he ever had. He taught me how to become a gentleman. He tutored me and taught me how to ride, to which I showed much skill and served me well all my life. I learned the art of fox hunting and was tutored in literature and conversation. And Anne taught me proper etiquette and ballroom dancing. Through them, I learned to conduct myself in proper society. With their guidance, I entered a world I had only known from a distance. Most importantly, they introduced me to Colonel Fairfax and his gracious wife, Sarah, who took me to their bosoms as a member of the family. The Colonel granted me full access to his vast library, training me in the arts and fine furnishings. I became acquainted with their son, George William, who had just returned from school in England. Although several years older than I, we soon became fast friends, a circumstance which lasted all our lives. During this time, with the assistance of Lawrence, I was able to obtain the services of a tutor in the field of surveying and followed my father into that profession. Upon Lawrence developing a severe respiratory illness, I moved into Mount Vernon to assist in the management of the plantation. At the young age of 15, I had already attained my full height of well over six feet, unusual for that period of time. Dressed in my fine clothing, I was able to enter fully into the social structure of Virginia society. I became a regular at many of the fox hunts, being gifted on horseback, and a desired guest at many of the finest balls and sarays due to Anne's assistance in the art of ballroom dancing. While Martha became my one true love, I cannot in good faith claim her as my first, as I became infatuated with a number of young ladies from the best families. A great deal of excitement was generated with the arrival of Lord Fairfax to the Virginia colony. His presence and friendship were the final link to my future success. Not only did he become a friend and mentor, he commissioned me to join a survey team traveling west to develop his western properties, assuring many future commissions, which proved eminently profitable. Low to leave Lawrence's side, I was encouraged enough by his seeming recovery to leave him and join the expedition. Thus the beginning of my ventures into the western wilderness the first of many times I was to spend there, either working in my profession or serving with the militia. I must admit to being shocked by the deplorable conditions of the pioneer families. In fact, with not a whit of subtlety and a great deal of youthful ignorance and arrogance, I in correspondence, referred to them as a parcel of barbarians, an uncouth set of people living like a parcel of dogs or cats, and happy be he that gets the berth nearest the fire. However, I returned an accomplished surveyor with a greater understanding of the importance of the wilderness to the growth of the colonies. My surveying business being both brisk and profitable, allowed me to buy several plantations. However, in 1751, 
a tragic turn of events caused me to take absence from my work. Lawrence's illness became life-threatening, and he was advised to spend the winter in Barbados or risk his life. Since Anne was fully occupied with the care of their daughter, I took it upon myself to accompany him. This trip was the only time I ever left the American colonies. And for the first time, I realized my happiness decreased in direct proportion to the distance from my Potomac River roots. Within days of arriving in Barbados, I was stricken with a severe case of smallpox, which along with great discomfort left my face pitted and scarred for the remainder of my life. Upon my recovery, Lawrence insisted that I return home, and he sent with me a letter to Colonel Fairfax, imploring him to see to my future. Sadly, June of 1752, Lawrence returned to Mount Vernon to die, leaving all who knew him bereft and stricken with grief. In his will, he left Mount Vernon to his wife and daughter with the provision if both died before leaving male heir, the plantation would go to me. That coming to pass, I became the master of Mount Vernon. That this tragedy should benefit me troubled me to no end. I would have given all this and whatever else I possessed to have Lawrence once again by my side. True to his word, Colonel Fairfax proved to be of great assistance. His advice and aid was essential to the success of my development of Mount Vernon. Moreover, he proposed me for membership in Fredericksburg Masonic Lodge No. 4. On the fourth day of August, 1753, I was raised to the sublime degree of a Master Mason and thereby earned the right to call each of you my brother. I was most pleased to be part of a fraternity whose belief system so closely mirrored mine. Moreover, I received great pleasure from the table lodges, which were composed in equal parts of feasting, toasting, drinking, social intercourse, and Masonic education. They often lasted late into the night and required overnight lodging for those who traveled some distance and those whose pursuit of conviviality lapsed into overindulgence and excess. In the spirit of truthfulness that I have pledged to you, my motives were not of the purest sort, being more intent on gaining acceptance into that class of Virginia gentlemen than absorbing the moral knowledge available to me. I did take to delight in learning that it was a brotherhood of kindred spirits and found to my pleasure that their precepts and doctrines agreed with my already formed beliefs. Only later did I realize the full impact of masonry and its importance to the formation of our fledgling country. So I shall withhold further discourse till a more suitable moment. It was the time of the French and Indian War, and remembering Lawrence resplendent in his uniform, I joined the Virginia militia with the rank of major. I spent a great deal of time in the wilderness performing a number of dangerous and onerous tasks for the crown, earning the rank of colonel. I served under British commanders who had distinguished themselves on the battlefields of Europe but sadly, were unable to adapt to the methods of combat necessary to succeed against the cunning 
tactics of the native tribes, suffering more defeats than victories. Furthermore, they refused to take the advice of the colonists, whose experience would have been valuable. Serving under General Braddock at the Battle of Monongahela, only the bravery of our Virginia troops saved the army from complete disaster. Fighting a rearguard action, our losses were severe, but we saved the British regulars from ignominious defeat. Riding back and forth to rally my troops, while under intense fire, I had two noble steeds shot out from under me and felt the tug of four bullet holes piercing my uniform without a single scratch to my person. This caused the Indian tribes to give me a name that roughly translates as he who cannot be killed. My service to the crown during this trying time led me to my first inkling that though we believed ourselves loyal subjects to the crown, equal to all free-born English, our beliefs were not shared by England. Though having through merit risen to the rank of colonel, I was subservient to even the lowest officers of the regular army. So began my understanding that my loyalty might be misguided, a belief shared by a great number throughout the colonies. In ill humor, I resigned my commission and began my journey home to resume my life as a Virginia planter. During this time, I, through great fortune, made the acquaintance of a young widow named Martha Custis. At our first meeting, I knew that I had found my soul mate. After some entreaty, I was able to gain Martha's acceptance of my troth. And on the sixth day of January, 1759, I took her to wife and established our permanent home at Mount Vernon, bringing with us her two children, Jackie and Patsy. One of the rumors I wish to dispel states that our marriage was not founded on love. Nothing could be further from the truth. Never have a man and a woman been more suited to one another than we. I found union with a woman who possessed such positive qualities that I was amazed and enthralled of having received such good fortune. Loving, kind, loyal, and devoted. Martha was a gracious and charming hostess, an incredibly hard-working mistress of our home, and my staunchest supporter in any endeavor. She was my dearest friend and closest confidant. I could not and would not have taken on the duties and responsibilities imposed upon me by our country without her love and support. Thus began the most joyous period of my life. If England would have but treated us as equals, I would never have need to travel so far from the center of my universe, nor left for any period of time the warmth of my wife's devotion. I became, in truth, a Virginia gentleman planter, striving tirelessly in my own fields as a true steward of the land. Like all Virginia planters, I found myself constantly in need of new lands to overcome the devastating effects of raising tobacco. I threw myself into agriculture, gaining as much knowledge as possible. It led me to believe that the secret to the successful use of the soil involved rotation of crops, leaving a seventh part untilled to bring natural refreshment. This also allowed me to raise a wide variety of crops for domestic and export, lessening the dependence on tobacco. 
Building a grist mill to process the grains we grew, I soon began grinding for my neighbors at a substantial profit. Likewise, a blacksmith shop produced such a high standard of work, it soon became a hub of industry. One of my most profitable enterprises was the distilling of rye whiskey, having amongst my staff a man knowledgeable in that profession. The Potomac supported a wealth of fish, especially during spawning season, so I commissioned a schooner to harvest this bounty. On a good year, we would ship as much as one million salted herring to England, Portugal, and the West Indies. In short, I, through industry and dis discipline, became a great wealthy person. However, one major shortcoming to which I must humbly admit was as a spendthrift. I lavished on Martha and Patsy the most fashionable and expensive gowns, dressed myself and Jackie in the most splendid garb, and even spent heavily making sure my house servants were clothed in such a way as to announce our wealth. The height of my hedonism even led to the purchase of a carriage displaying the finest trappings finished in gold. Our home at Mount Vernon was a swirl of social activity. No weekend passed without a full house of invited family and guests. No expense was spared to provide the finest meals on the finest settings, served with the finest in wines. In fact, Mount Vernon was the first home in the colonies to display Wedgwood China. Our weekends were spent in various pursuits, not the least being the chasing of the fox. And evenings were given to dining and dancing, which Martha and I thoroughly enjoyed. This lavish lifestyle kept me in constant debt to my English brokers, who with relish catered to our every need. Much has been written about my religious beliefs, much of it negative. In actuality, I was an active participant in the Anglican Church, later to become the Episcopal Church, holding a number of different lay positions. In fact, George Mason, along with my dear friend George Fairfax, and I, as as lay persons of the church in 1762 were largely responsible for the building of Falls Episcopal Church. However, I, along with a number of my contemporaries, would more properly be considered deists, strongly influenced by our Masonic beliefs that all religions deserve respect. These beliefs strongly influenced the construction of our new government in relation to freedom of religion. Many of my letters during that period reflect on my views, including my support for the Catholic and Jewish faith, and my strong stance on the separation of church and state. Being of boundless energy and having a need to give of myself, I also held a number of political offices during that time, including my election to the Virginia House of Burgesses. Both Martha and I hoped that this time in our lives would never end. Our love for each other, our joy in sharing our lives with family and friends, and our love of the land brought us the greatest contentment and peace of mind. Oh, that the Supreme Architect would have granted me that I should live out my life in the place I love so much with those I love so deeply. But alas, it was not to be. Those early events 
like the refusal to grant me office in the regular army, soon brought me into accord with my fellow colonists. And coupled with such events as the Stamp Act, the Townshend Act, the Boston Port Act, along with many other indignities, caused an uproar that could not be contained. The colonists who in the main had always considered themselves loyal Englishmen now began to view themselves as Americans. And indeed, they had become such, hardened by the need to convert a wilderness into a productive home where they could raise their families. Formed by a land that was fresh and new and clean, we chose the right to self-government. Though a quiet participant in the rhetoric surrounding resounding through the colonies, I, I grew to strongly support this new way of thinking. Because I became committed to the cause, I left behind my home and family, drawn by the call of duty to join those Americans committed to freedom. I will not dwell on all that transpired, well, but would rather select this moment to discuss the impact of Freemasonry upon the birth of our nation. A brief discourse of the Freemasonry of that period would prove helpful at this point. To understand the impact of our fraternity, one must first understand the Age of Enlightenment. In about 1650, the Age of Reason took root in Western Europe. Diverse philosophies and beliefs were expressed for the first time without fear of punishment and suppression. This led in the early 1700s to the Age of Enlightenment, where an intelligent and gifted men like Pope, Hume, Descartes, and Voltaire gave voice to new and creative ideas that will change the world. In France and England, many societies came forth from seclusion in order to exercise their freedom to meet and discuss these new ideas of those Freemasonry took hold. Melding the organizational structure of the Masonic guilds and the precepts espoused in the Age of Enlightenment, brotherly love, equality, separation of church and state, government by the people, and morality, Freemasonry appealed to those men seeking liberation from the old restraints. Remember that when I knelt at the altar of Freemasonry and took my vows in 1753, the Grand Lodge of England was only 36 years old. Masonry soon spread like wildfire, quickly finding its way to the American colonies. There has been much debate about the impact of Freemasonry as a contributing force to the revolution and the formation of the Republic. The American Revolution was not a product of our fraternity. It was a consensus of a large segment of the colonists that a separation from England was the path they chose to follow. Not all colonists shared in this belief. A large number would have preferred to remain loyal to the crown. Among this group were a large number of Masons. With adherents of both camps belonging to the same lodges arose a situation that could have caused major rifts. However, as in England where Tories and Whigs were vigorous and vocal foes, the dictates of the Grand Lodge forbade political discussion within the Lodge. Although quickly gaining in popularity, Freemasonry comprised no more than 1% of the population. To gauge its impact on the future of the colonies, 22 members of the First Continental Congress were Freemasons, as were 65 of the 217 members of the Second Congress. 33 of the 55 delegates who wrote the Constitution were Freemasons. 
parts of the preamble of the Constitution come almost verbatim from Masonic text. And at least eight of the signers of the Declaration were Freemasons. During the Revolutionary War, those dark and cold years, many of the commanding generals were of the craft. A large number of my staff were Freemasons. And military lodge meetings during the cold winter at Valley Forge were important to keeping up the Army's morale. But would the revolution have succeeded without France's infatuation with that beloved scoundrel, Brother Ben Franklin? The military skill of Ethan Allen, commander of the Green Mountain Boys who took Ticonderoga. The naval exploits of John Paul Jones. The work of men like John Hancock, Sam Adams, and the sacrifice of Brother Joseph Warren at the Battle of Bunker Hill. I promise to not discuss in general my years as commander of the Army and President. These long years were a counterbalance of my sadness at being away from Mount Vernon and my feeling of gratitude to have been of service to my country. To have Martha at my side during the long, cold winters of the war years, sacrificing her own happiness to bolster my resolve, allowed me to bear the burden I had been given. I will only reference two things that I feel must be included. The first was my relationship with my beloved son, Gilbert, the Marquis Lafayette. One of my regrets was never having born any children. For whatever reason, Martha and I were unable to conceive. My close relationship with my two stepchildren, and along with the adoption of formal and informal adoptions of a larger number of children, gave both of us great joy. But having made the acquaintance of this young French nobleman, I have since considered him my son, and he, orphaned early in life, called me his father. Of all those I hold dear, I must admit that my brother Lawrence, my wife Martha, and the young Marquis hold my deepest affections. Gilbert's bravery, wit, and affections toward me caused me to admire him greatly. I received no greater honor than Gilbert christening his son as George Washington Modier, along with other courageous European soldiers, such as Baron von Steuben, who was enchanted by her cause, Lafayette served and was essential to winning the war. Unlike von Steuben, who took up American citizenship, my beloved son, Gilbert, returned to his family in France. Ironically, Lafayette, the hero of our revolution, was imprisoned in France as an aristocrat. Using my powers as president, I was able to help him regain his freedom, and we were again able to spend time together on his visit to Mount Vernon. The second point I wish to bring to your attention was the importance of France's support in our quest for independence. Without it, we may not have emerged victor victorious whether France supported us out of friendship or to do harm to their British enemies is nearly identical to our country's defending France in what you refer to as the Second World War. At Yorktown, the deciding battle of the revolution, our conjoined forces of American and French troops had numerical superiority on the battlefield. However, a large British fleet had disembarked from New York with 8,000 British troops. If they had landed, the combination of their ground troops and the firepower of their naval guns could have turned the tide of battle. To our good fortune, 
the French fleet arrived early and laid a trap for the British, beating them decisively and forcing their return to New York. Whether remembering the blood-stained grounds of Yorktown or the hallowed field of Normandy, both nations should be thankful one to the other. With the signing of the peace treaty in 1783, I was able to resign my commission and return to Mount Vernon without any thought of ever leaving again. The question has often raised as to if I was ever asked to assume the role of king. It is true that a number of Americans espoused to the political structure of England. A member of my staff, speaking for a number of officers, sent me a letter asking me to consider such an honor. In the most dramatic manner, I squelched that notion, explaining that my support was for a government of the people, for the people, and most importantly, by the people. My exposure to Freemasonry and its impact on the foundation of America and my constant contact with men of such a high caliber refreshed my interest in the craft. From 1777 on, I was present at over 100 Masonic events, none more pleasing than September 18, 1793, when I, with a group of distinguished brothers in full Masonic regalia and with proper pomp and ritual, laid the cornerstone of the United States Capitol. Returning home brought both Martha and I great joy. Although it was also a time of much labor since I had been away some years serving without pay and Mount Vernon suffering from much neglect. A great part of our time was spent enlarging our home to accommodate the flood of guests, both invited and uninspected, that constantly arrived at our door. In fact, during this time, it became necessary at this time to cut down several beautiful cherry trees to make way for the new portico, amusing only because it brings to mind that silly and untrue legend about my youth. In 1789, Alexandria Lodge No. 22 received a charter from the Grand Lodge of Virginia, and I had the distinct honor and privilege of becoming its first master. However, in the same year, I was called away to serve my country. This honor was bestowed upon me somewhat against my will. Great pressure was exerted, and so with some reluctance, I left Mount Vernon. In 1789, I was inaugurated as the first president of the United States. There was great debate at that time concerning the form of our new government between the Federalists who wanted a strong union and the states' rights advocates who favored a looser confederation. I, believing that only with a strong union could we survive as a national entity? With even greater reluctance and deep disappointment by Martha, I was re-elected for a second term. Finally, adamantly refusing to run again, I left public service for good and returned home for the final time to my beloved Mount Vernon. We hope for a long and pleasurable retirement, but the Supreme Architect had different plans. During my normally, normal daily custom of rising early and attending to business, I went out in blustery weather, which first turned to rain and then to sleet. 
Upon arriving home, I was advised by Martha to change before dinner. But not wanting to delay our guests, I foolishly chose not to do so. The next morning, I rose with a sore throat, advancing quickly to pneumonia, a condition which soon became untenable. My passing caused my beloved Martha great grief. She retired from that time forward to a small apartment on our third floor, never again sleeping in our bed, it being too painful for her. My funeral being Masonic in form, only a sword and my Masonic apron lay upon my coffin, which was born to a vault on my property by members of the craft where it still lies beside my beloved Martha. This drought being consumed, my visit is expired. I hope this dissertation has not caused you great boredom since it gave me much pleasure. I only wish to have you understand your brother better, to see me as a man who, although having many failings, did his best as mason and man to live a good life. Think of me not as general or president, simply as a brother that you have met upon the level. May the supreme architect of the universe bless you and yours. Good night, my brothers, but not farewell. To plagiarize our dear brother Robert Burns, happy to meet, sorry to part hoping to meet again.